Hey class, so this is it. This is the end. We made it. We made it to the end of the semester. I'm, first off, I'm really proud of all the responses you've uh, put into this class. I'm really proud of how you've interpreted the material. This is an intro to intro level course, but it's still a pretty high level course as far as like social media criticism is concerned. There's not many places to get this type of uh, reading material in this form, so it's it's actually not as accessible as you might imagine, but you've all handled it in a very, very amazing and critical way. And, and reading your work, especially some of you have like literally written things that have changed the way I see the way that social media works. It was a really great semester and I really appreciate you doing it. Second, I really, really appreciate you handling it in this modality. You know, you did this course fully online. You did this in an asynchronous format. You had to subscribe to a Substack. You had to watch videos on YouTube. You had to listen inside the lecture for how to do your homework. That's a lot of commitment and it is a, it is a form of learning that obviously we're gonna have to take a look at as the time goes on and as climate change becomes a, a, a prevalent factor in our future, as well as the potential of future pandemics, which cross our fingers doesn't happen within our living lifetimes um, enough to create such chaos, or vice versa, we have a way of handling that scenario better than the way we did this time. But regardless, this modality of learning, this way of uh, engaging with online material is probably never going to leave us now. Like there's this, this version of learning will probably be here forever, Zoom school or uh, asynchronous learning, that type of education is now gonna be co-existent with it. And to be honest, I'm actually somewhat happy about that, and I'll tell you why. And it's because faculty or instructors or lecturers or, or teachers took a hold of it and actually made it their own. They, they created their own formats, they designed it themselves. It was a bottom-up design factor that allowed teachers to really figure out how to speak to their students the most appropriate way. Years ago, I made a prediction that actually fortunately has come incorrect, which was that eventually within the 2020s, online uh, social media would eventually start their own educational formats with like facebook.edu or google.edu and so forth. Like they would create alternative learning or what's known as alt-ac uh, learning scenarios, but it would be under the guise of surveillance capitalism. Now, yes, I know that many of you went to uh, high school with Google uh, programs, Chromebooks, and a lot of Google Docs uh, material, but that's not the same thing. They didn't create bottom-up structures of how to teach. Often that curriculum came from designers, curriculum designers or instructional designers from inside the school, not from outside and inside of Silicon Valley. Because what we're going to talk about today is what comes next? What comes next for all of this? And Silicon Valley kind of does have the reins over what technology and what ways we access this media. But does that mean that they're fully in control? I think that what, what we've revealed over the course of this pandemic is that we have a lot of control over how we access this. On the other hand, we don't really have an outside to it, as we've discussed multiple times during the semester, that even though we have a lot of control of how we use social media and how we access it, because we don't have an outside, it's very easy for bad actors to take advantage and exploit those systems through misinformation or heavy media flows that don't actually help us, don't move us forward, but rather either distract us or create some sort of mild chaos that doesn't really work out. As we've learned this semester as well is how much uh, social media has the ability to push us down these rabbit holes, to give us communities that are bad for our health, bad for our community, and bad for our, kind of bad for our future. And we saw that at the insurrection at the beginning of this year, that many of those people were told, how did you get here? How did you know about this? And their answer was often YouTube or Facebook. Those Facebook groups had turned people into um, angry or fearful, and they convinced them to take action. So we see that it has negative effects. When I'm talking about education in this sense, I, I mean this in the sincerest way possible. It means that because the pandemic happened or because we had this punctuation in our forward progress, we have to reconsider how we access the media. And that question may not have actually occurred had the pandemic not occurred because we were kind of getting comfortable with how technology was uh, evolving and how it was flowing. So there's a couple things I want to introduce to you today on the last day, on our last lecture. I'm going to go over some of the terms that you're going to be hearing that are going to be probably part of our ambient web pretty much for the rest of our lives. And those have a lot to do with crypto um, and NFTs. So let's go over a couple of those terms so you know what you're basically walking into. Here's a couple of terms. Cryptocurrency, okay, uh, NFTs, 
DAOs, D-A-O's, and Web3. Those are terms that you're going to start hearing quite a bit about in the next few years. But you should really understand how they operate and be critical of them. Don't just accept them as is. First, cryptocurrency is a decentralized market for money. So it's basically money without a central bank. It's unregulated. It allows the people to decide what its value is. And what that means is that when you invest in cryptocurrencies, you're investing in what's known as the blockchain. And the blockchain is a open ledger, uh, basically a database of all the different ways you could access it. And the blockchain is I, best, I guess the best way to think about it is an inventory of everything. It's everything online, everything that's digital has an inventory, has a ledger, it has a string of numbers that is unique to every single transaction that could take place. It creates both transparency and intransparency. Because of the nature of the, the dark web, you don't have to use a public figure to buy cryptocurrency. So you could just invest in cryptocurrency without an identification, without a bank account, without anything. You could just purchase it and it will be pretty much unconnected to any regulated bank, which makes it a little nerve wracking for many people who are um, into uh, you know, regulation of money and watching this go into different places. Bitcoin is rated on a weird index based on a scale of fear to greed. And that's a strange way of thinking about it, but that's what happens when you don't have a central dollar or something that says it's here. Now, on that other hand, Bitcoin is based on physical currency. When we talk about Bitcoin, we relate it to our actual money. So if it's currently, let's say, I don't know the current price today, let's say it's $45,000 per Bitcoin. That's $45,000 US dollars. It's not 45,000 whatevers. It's, it's related to US currency when we talk about it. So that means it still relies on our actual physical dollar there. Now, Bitcoin enthusiasts will say that's only temporary. Soon we won't need the dollar. Soon we'll be free of that and its value will be related to, I guess, goods and services because eventually you'll be able to use Bitcoin instead of money and trade it the way you do. So when you go to the store and you trade money for goods and services, or let's say you wanted to buy a Gatorade, you bring physical currency or money currency inside of a bank and you trade that for the object. In theory, crypto will be that way. Now the downside of crypto is that it wavers. So one day your Gatorade might be worth one point, no, 0 0.0003 crypto, and the next day it might be worth 0 0.005 crypto, and the next day it might be one crypto, one Bitcoin. That's a big waiver, but that's how many people are investing. Now, because Bitcoin is technically finite, at a certain point it finishes uh, searching for it or mining it. And what that means is that cryptocurrencies are often attached to very large mining systems. It's slowly doing math problems to figure out what the bottom answer is. And eventually, if, when it's finished, you have a complete currency. As of this moment, no cryptocurrency is complete. There is no closed cryptocurrency. They're all still currently being mined, which means, like money, you have to imagine it, which means that very often cryptocurrencies are mimetic. They have to be believed in. You have to believe in them to work. And that's manifest value. And many people actually say, well, one of the biggest shames of crypto is that many crypto enthusiasts say, um, if we believe it'll happen, it'll happen. And they actually do make it happen. That's how the Game Stonks thing happened back in January. They wanted to inflate a physical stock uh, in EA Sports and GameStop, and they used Reddit to inflate a physical stock, like an actual regulated stock. And that's a manifest, a uh, belief in it. Now, if you get in early, of course it works. But that's where crypto sort of looks like a pyramid scheme. Because it requires belief to get in, it requires other people to participate. At a certain point, it reaches saturation point. But if you're at the top and you own a lot of it, then you need people to own a little less than that. And then you need people to own a little less than that and a little less than that. And eventually, hmm, looks like a pyramid. So that's how it kind of structures itself is because the people who invest at the bottom through like Robinhood aren't actually purchasing crypto. They're purchasing through a service that's buying crypto as a holding. You're, you're holding crypto. And in that holding, you're supporting the people at the very top who hold a lot of it in whole, as in they use the blockchain to purchase it or mine it. They actually have it because they've downloaded the entirety of the blockchain onto their computer and they could see it. That's how blockchain works as well, is that every one of us have the ability to download the entirety of the blockchain onto our computers. And we could host blockchain across a decentralized network. So that's the term we'll keep hearing is decentralized. Now the downside, my biggest criticism, and the reason I don't personally invest. Now, caveat here, I did invest, I lost it. I bought, my, I bought a Bitcoin at $22 back in 2010 or 11, I can't remember. I lost the key gen. And so it's gone, it's gone, gone. Like I'll never get it back, it's a long story, but the hard drive is gone where the key gen was on it. There's, you need three keys to unlock your Bitcoin. I 
found out later that over 25% of all Bitcoin is lost. No one will ever retrieve it ever again in a similar fashion, which means some of it is in belief of the belief. Now, I don't invest not just because of that, but I don't invest because think about the blockchain using electricity. Right now, just Bitcoin, I'm not talking about Ethereum or any of the other coins that are out there, just Bitcoin uses more electricity than the country of Switzerland and two other countries. It's using so much electricity just to stay online because remember, it has to be hosted. The money, decentralized money has to be hosted. It has to be somewhere. Much the way our bank accounts have to be hosted, but there's still a bank, a centralized banking software that holds it up. It keeps that number static. Whereas crypto has to be constantly hosted and constantly maintained. And it's burning so much electricity at this point. There's no carbon offset yet for it. Ethereum says, that's another coin, Ethereum says that by 2025, it will be offsetting by... Uh, like expenditures of like extra, like when you use solar power, if you power your entire house, you're not actually powering your house. You're sending the power to the central grid and the grid is sending you a, a coupon so you don't have to pay electricity, but you're not actually powering your house. Some people may have Tesla batteries, they're just for backup. So same thing works with crypto is that you're sending it to a centralized server and that centralized server offsets everything else. Now in theory, that offset will offset its, its green waste or its, its terrible effects on the environment. And I think there's just any number of articles you could find now that talk about how bad crypto is for the environment. The other terms are NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Many of you see people going very big on the hype around the lazy lions or the crypto punks, these little images that are being sold for $250,000 each. Those aren't images being sold. I'm just going to be clear about that. They are the links to the images. That's what an NFT is. A non-fungible token is a non-repeatable or non-fakeable link to where that image is actually stored. So now think about how an NFT is bad for the environment. First, you have to put the image somewhere, which they call minting or gassing. They have to put it somewhere. So they put it on the blockchain. And basically all that means is you put it on a server anywhere you want and it guarantees its location. So now there's a link, you know, like blah, 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 dot JPEG, you know, um, and that link gets a receipt, which is just the, let's say a URL, and you can purchase that URL. That means no one else can have access to that URL. Basically gives you the rights to use that image or that URL. That's what NFTs are. You're not actually buying an image, you're buying a link to an image. Again, the belief of these things matters more than anything else. And very often NFTs come around as clout. Uh, the reason why people buy NFTs is because it's, it's cool. Like people could show up at weird parties and say that they have a lazy lion, but it has no real inherent value. But it also makes this question, what NFTs brings to us and why it's a good thing to always talk about is what is the inherent value of art in general? Why do we even put value in art? And I always talk about art in terms of art history. When you go to a museum, you see a beautiful painting and you re recognize it, let's just say it's a Rembrandt. When you go up to a Rembrandt, Rembrandt's value of his paint did not have value in his lifetime. He was selling it for mediocre middle prices in Amsterdam and he got around a little bit, but he wasn't a lucrative painter. His art became valuable after his death. So that means after Rembrandt was alive, the value went up and now it's in museums, but you have to keep this in mind when you're in a museum. When you're standing across from that painting, about the a little further the distance I'm standing here from the camera, when you're standing across from that, you have to remember you're standing in the same place that Rembrandt was standing when he was painting it, an arm's length away, a little less. And as you're standing there, you have to remember that through time, somewhere through time, that painting has made it all the way through time to make it all the way to that museum, to make it to your eyes. And there's value in that. Who decides on that value? How did we know how much that value would be? How did you know it was supposed to be in a museum? What about all the art that isn't in a museum? And so a lot of NFT people believe that there's some boosterism to giving credit to digital artists who may not have had access to museums or ways of becoming popular or visible in any other way. And to give them credit, that's true. Digital artists often don't get any credit for anything. And that's why a lot of memes have become NFTs is because memes often go very viral without any compensation whatsoever to the person in the photo. Take Disaster Girl, for example. Disaster Girl's story um, is really great. And there's a, a great podcast you should listen to called Endless Thread on WBUR, which talks about what it means to mint that NFT. So now that NFT is, it was bought by, um, I believe a, a somebody from Saudi Arabia, same person who bought a couple of N other NFTs, a couple other viral videos, including Charlie Bit My Finger. Um, that NFT now means that they have Ethereum, they have money that they can cash out. They could 
cash out their Ethereum or liquefy their Ethereum, liquefy meaning turn into US currency, and have money. So they were given the money. Now, for the first time, that young woman was paid for her vast use of her image without any compensation. The same goes for the Doge dog. It was already copyrighted, but now that since it's been made into an NFT, it has compensation. So I get it. I get it. I'm serious. I get why NFTs are important. On the other hand, it is very hype filled. It doesn't have really any value whatsoever unless we believe in it. And it's just good to have that conversation going. I think that's the important factor that we're constantly thinking about. And that helps us try to figure out what value we actually get from this. And honestly, since I'm a skeptic, it, I'm not the right person to ask about it. Again, NFTs take even more electricity than crypto does because now it's storing several things at the exact same time. And in order to have access to your image, your original content, that server can't ever turn off. So you're basically guaranteeing some place. However, we've seen several crypto scams and NFT scams thus far that have given links or sold NFTs to people. And when they access the link, the image is long gone. And then there's this whole thing about right click and saving because that's a joke of crypto markets because some people believe they're buying the image, not realize they're buying the link. And so when people think they're buying the image and somebody downloads that, that uh, NFT or the image, they think they've been robbed and they haven't been robbed because they still own the rights to it. But it's now somebody thinks that because again, this has a lot to do with inherent value or imagined value. These are the conversations we should be having. The next one is about DAOs, 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 Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. They're basically crypto for people. Uh, you can um, get a group together um, and co-own something. Uh, it's basically a crypto market that's an inner market. It's sort of like a hedge fund for um, money. So a hedge fund is a market outside the market. So it's like private equity. You can buy hedge funds. You need a million dollars to get into a hedge fund, whereas a DAO doesn't need a million dollars. So it's kind of like more accessible. They tried to buy the constitution uh, a few weeks ago and it didn't work out. Um, they bid for, they collected together as a DAO, $40 million to buy a copy of the US constitution, which in theory makes a lot of sense because the constitution is a document of the people for the people and shouldn't the people own it decentralized? Well, a billionaire, because he's a billionaire, purchase it for 43 million. And because he's a billionaire, 43 million is like, I don't know, it's equivalent of you dropping like $7. So it's, it's not really uh, the same scale. And that's the other thing too, is that money kind of doesn't make sense in general anyway. I think we've talked about money scale before. When you talk about a thousand seconds, we're talking about like 12 minutes and we talk about a million seconds and we're talking about 11 days and then we talk about a billion seconds and you're talking about 32 years. Okay, it's big differences, huge scalable differences that we don't ever think about. So money itself is mimetic. So I get all of it, I get it, all right? But again, I'm skeptical because of the way it's being functioned and it doesn't have a way of making sure that it helps people in general. And that brings me to my last term, Web3, the next iteration of the internet. Currently we're in Web 2.0 or the semantic web. That's where you could search the internet. And the way that they always put it is that web one was the read web. It was the time where you could access the web and read it. It wasn't really accessible for us to write into it. It was just accessible as we could access it and get information. Uh, web 2.0 is the read write web, RW. The read write, you could access it, you could create, you could buy Amazon, Google, uh, eBay, all of that is web 2.0 technology and we're all still in that world. Web three, they say, is RWO, read, write, own. And so what they're trying to say is that it will protect people's rights and basically give ownership to your property. Again, you could imagine by this point in the lecture, my big skepticism here is access. What if you don't have money? What if you don't have the ability to do that? The internet is supposed to be open and accessible and it already costs us money because we pay an ISP, an internet service provider, to give us the access to the internet. But what if now you have to pay tokens or pay access points to get into things? Think about who has to be charged to own things and who doesn't, and then think about things like paywalls. Certain news that you access has paywalls. You can't access it. But guess who doesn't have paywalls? A lot of very uh, bad actors and far-right media do not put paywalls up, and they don't put them up because that information is easily spreadable. And so we think about access and bad actors and good actors and how this is all run, and we have to understand that Web3 I don't think has really thought itself through yet, but it's very hyped as with everything else. So where does social media sit in with all this? So social media itself is our structural communications platform underneath it. 
And as of this point, TikTok is more downloaded than Facebook and Instagram. And it really is getting to the point where I'm wondering what comes next after TikTok. Because now we're getting to the point where we have to start thinking about what did the 2020s really look like? We're only a year into it. And it's already shaping up to be a very strange decade between Web3, DAOs, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, and all the different apps that you've accessed. When algorithms start becoming smarter and machine thinking becomes more uh, aware, we have to start realizing that we ourselves are still part of it. We still create the media for social media. We, us, we make social media. We are social media. And that's exactly why <laughs> To, to spin this back around to the class, the, the, the assignment is you are new media or you are all of this, okay? This is you, you are it. And that's to, to reiterate what we're doing for that final is that you are picking something that affected you immensely, something that you were like, not immensely, but something that you were just like, you know what, this, this I thought about more than anything else this semester. Pick that subject and I want you to take that subject and pretend you're explaining to somebody who's never taken this course, somebody who you'd like to translate this material for. Because at this point, I would consider you no longer amateurs. You are now experts in this field. You could start learning much more about it. You've had access to a lot of different information. But I want to hear it in your words. You're the teacher now. You're the one that's going to say it to a grandma or an aunt or somewhere. at the Chris Think about doing this at the Christmas table and trying to explain it in the most easily and accessible way possible. Because that to me is important. That shows a, a literacy, a, a social media literacy or a new media literacy that tells me that you've not only ingested, but you have the ability to translate. You take the ideas in your brain and turn it into something. And it always makes this project really fun. I usually take these and I keep them as an archive. <laughs> I put them in like a folder and I just remember them. And they're, I've had them for years. I've had, I have six or seven years worth of these. And it is fascinating to see what changes. The, the curriculum is almost similar. It, it evolves every semester because time changes. But it is, I do put structural elements in every single class to see if they hit the same. And so they, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to be covering at the end of this semester. Because to me, that tells me where this is going, where you feel social media is actually unfolding in front of your eyes. And to that matter, you know, I, again, I'm really proud of you for making it this far. I'm watching everything and going through it. But remember, it's you who have control over this. Don't ever let that go. Don't ever let somebody tell you you're not making these decisions. Whatever we move into in the next iteration of social media, think critically about it. Don't accept it as it is. Make sure you try to see how it's going to unfold. And think about, as I always say, who's left out? And why are they left out? What's missing and what's being repeated? Remember those tetrads? Always play the tetrad game when you wanna do it. See what's being made obsolete, what could go wrong. And if you play that game with everything that's going forward, you'll at least make better decisions on to how to join these platforms, make better buying decisions, and make better choices overall in your life. And if you do it right, you'll help the people around you too. So thank you for all your time. Thank you for this wonderful semester and thank you for all your uh, input you've had here. If you never need to reach me, my email's always gonna be the same. So please feel free to email me if you have any questions or you need a, a reference letter or something like that. Or if you just have something you wanna share about social media, I love getting links from you guys. So please stay in touch. Um, and uh, looking forward to your final projects. And uh, as always, stay curious, stay vigilant and stay healthy.